Our final reader tonight is another alumni, and um, I wish we could take credit for all her success, um, but she was already pretty uh, on fire when she got here. Erin and Trotta Kelly's debut novel, um, Blackbird Fly, was a 2015 Junior Library Guild selection, her 2015 Best Book of the South, and a finalist for the Pat Conroy Southern Book Prize. Blackbird Fly was also named one of ALA's most notable books of the year, earned an honor award for literature from the Asian Pacific Library Association, and received the Golden Kite Honor Award. Kirkus School Library Journal and the Center for Multicultural Literature all named Blackbird Fly as one of the best books of 2015. Her second novel, The Land of Forgotten Girls, was a finalist for the Independent Booksellers year, Book of the Year Award and recently received an APALA Award for Children's Literature. Booklist named The Land of Forgotten Girls one of the best contemporary books of 2016 and one of the top 10 multicultural novels of the year. Her third novel, Hello Universe. There you go. Yes, that's the one, right? <laughs> will be released next month. Hello Universe has earned starred reviews from S. Uh, SLJ, Booklist, Publishers Weekly, and Kirkus. Hello Universe also served as her, MF a her MFA thesis at Rosemont last year. Erin's short fiction has appeared in more than 30 journals worldwide and has been nominated for several national awards. <laughs> Please welcome Erin. Okay, so I'm going to read the first few chapters. Don't believe the chapters are short. Chapter 1. Ghost. Sometimes I stare into the dark corner of my bedroom and see the ghost of my sister Amelia. She's 10 years old, the age she would be now if she hadn't died, but she doesn't talk like a 10 year old. She has the eyes of a grandmother and the voice of a saint. She's raven haired, her skin is like cream. The perfect color skin, people always said. You sure have made a mess of things, she says, and then she disappears. After she leaves, the room is quiet except for the steady breathing of my youngest sister, Dominga, who everyone calls Ming, and the sound of the rats in the walls of Magnolia Tower, which is the name of the apartment building where we live. I've never seen a single magnolia on my street, and it's not much of a tower. Maybe the people who built it thought we wouldn't notice, so long as it had a good name. Magnolia Tower is in the town of Giverny, Louisiana. You've probably never heard of Giverny since no one wants to come here. I sure didn't. But this is where we came to live after my mother died and my father married Vea. She married him for his papers, the ones that would take him from the Philippines to America. Everyone knew it, even him, but he didn't care. He didn't know anything about raising little girls and Vea was the first woman wearing red lipstick to walk up to him at my mother's funeral. So sorry about May May falling sick that way, said Vea, but something in her voice told me she wasn't sorry at all and I didn't like how she made it sound like getting sick was my mother's decision. They say cancer, but I say broken heart, she continued. It must have been hard for her after little Amelia died. She was such a beautiful little girl. Vea looked right at me when she said it. I was standing there grim-faced with Ming on my hip. Now what you going to do, Juan, she said to my father. You can't go to America with two little girls all by yourself. We're going to live with Auntie Jove, I said. Maybe because I was little and I didn't know any better but I assumed it to be true. The sky is blue, the trees are green, and Mama had a sister who would take care of us. I couldn't imagine me and Ming being raised by our father. Vea was right about that. But as soon as the words leaped out of my mouth, I knew I was wrong. Vea's eyebrows shot up. She looked from me to my father. I didn't know Mei Mei had a sister, said Vea. My father glared down at me. Was he sad or mad or both? She doesn't, he said. Yes, she does, I said. Mama told me all about her. She has a sister named Javelin who rides elephants and goes on adventures in the Sahara Desert mm -hmm. and travels to faraway places like India and Macedonia. She has a blonde streak in her hair from the time she was blessed by fairies. She climbs mountains and flies airplanes. She's the most beautiful woman in the room, any room, and the cleverest, too. That's why no one ever sees her. She moves so fast and is so busy with adventures that she never stays in one place long. She can have any print she wants, but she doesn't want one. She is much too busy. <laughs> That's why she's even better than Cinderella or Snow White. My mother said so, my mother said. She doesn't have a sister, my father repeated. Behind him, a solemn crowd slowly approached, ready to say how sorry they were that my mother had died. What a tragedy, they would say again and again. Poor Juan, he had lost a daughter one year before and now he'd lost his wife. 
But Vea didn't move right away to make room for the others. Instead, she blinked at my father and smiled. So sad, she said. What a terrible thing to happen just before you were going to leave for the States. She brushed a painted fingernail against my father's cheek before she walked away. When she was gone, I looked up at my father and said, Mama had a sister, she told me so. Ming squirmed in my arms and buried her head in my neck. Those were fairy tales, Sol, he said, eyes focused straight ahead. You'll live a better life if you ignore made up stories and focus only on things you know to be true. Chapter two, the land of Giver Me. Things I know to be true. Tita Vea married my father so she could come to the States and there's nothing magical about that. And there is nothing magical about giving her e either. Even though it's just outside of New Orleans and people say New Orleans is loud and fun and vibrant, Giverney must have drained from its gutters. We live on the ground floor in apartment four. There are 16 apartments in the tower and there is nothing magical about apartment four. There is nothing magical about any of them, actually. Bea says they're all alike. Each one has a living room, two small square bedrooms, one cramped bathroom, and a kitchen with three cabinets. On each floor, there is a hallway right down the middle that's either too dark or too bright. When it's too bright, the light bulb makes a buzzing sound and you can see all the water stains on the ceiling. But when it's too dark, it feels like you're walking into a horror movie. Our apartment is at the end of the hallway, right next to a broken elevator and a dark stairway that looks like it leads to certain doom. The only nice things in my apartment are the four plants that sit under the window in the living room. The window isn't very big, so the plants are gathered up together to get the most sun they can. The plants are my favorite things in the apartment, but they belong to Bea, so I don't let on how much I like them. The apartments in the tower are considered affordable housing. There's a big sign on the building that says so. I didn't always know what that meant. At first, I thought it meant you get all the furniture in the apartment, because when we moved, the furniture was already there and it didn't even belong to us. And then I thought maybe affordable housing meant you only get really terrible furniture, <laughs> since ours had stuffing jutting out of the cushions and all of the legs on the coffee table were wobbly. But pretty soon I learned that affordable housing just meant you don't have much money. After one week of living in apartment four, I walked up to my father as he, could pa as he cooked pancit in the kitchen and said, Papa, can I ask you a question? He sighed. He didn't like questions. Finally, he said, yes, soul. If we don't like it here, can we send those papers back and go home? Instead of answering, he just sighed again. That was a long time ago. I'm 12 now, Ming is six, and we are still in apartment four. We still have the wobbly furniture and the rats in the walls. The only thing we don't have is Papa. Three years ago, he went to the Philippines for his father's funeral and he never came back. So I guess the answer to my question was yes, but only for him. Unfortunately, we still have Vea. You will call me mother, she said, soon after we moved to apartment four, back when Papa was still around, even though he was never really around. When she said this, Ming and I were sitting on the couch and Vea was standing over us smoking a cigarette. She didn't even flick the ashes into an ashtray. She just let them fall onto the carpet and then she'd rub them in with her foot. Ming blinked at her. I said, no, I won't. Vea grinned, you will, Soledad. I won't. I'm not a disobedient girl, even though Papa and Vea say I am. Bea thinks it's because I'm being raised in America, but that's not it. I just don't think it's right to obey orders that you know are wrong. And calling Bea mother was as bad as cursing God. I would take five years off my life before I would ever call Bea mother, because she is so unlike my real mother that it's hard to believe my papa ever wanted to marry her in the first place. My mother's skin was soft like a pillow. Bea's is rough like sandpaper. My mother liked to make up stories and fairy tales. Bea likes to tell us that we're too fat or too skinny or too disobedient. Bea smokes cigarettes until the countertops in the kitchen turn yellow. My mother put flowers behind her ear. You're a bad girl, Saul, said Bea. And do you know what happens to bad girls? No, I said. I smiled. Please tell me. Do they get ice cream and cake? Do they get to take rides in long limousines? Tell me, Tita Bea, what happens to bad little girls? Chapter 3. If you want to know what happens to bad girls who live with an evil stepmother, I'll tell you. They get put in the closet. You've probably heard that before. But when you are the daughter of May May Madrid, closets are of no concern to you because a closet can become anything. Your mind is a palace. That's what my mommy used to say. So the first time Vea sent me to the closet, I pretended I was inside a rocket. 
the kind they launch into space. When Vea took the chair away from the doorknob and released me, I stayed in for an extra 15 minutes <laughs> until Ming opened the door and stuck her head inside. Why haven't you come out, she asked. I'm not sure if the atmosphere is safe, I said. What is your world like, Earthling? <laughs> Ming looked around the inside of the closet at the bent hangers, beat up shoes, and dusty toys, and then raised her eyebrows at me. Huh, she said. I have been transported into space. You are the first being I have seen in 32 years. Tell me, what is your planet like? <laughs> Ming turned around and looked at her bedroom. Then she scratched behind her ear and said, it's kind of messy. <laughs> I nodded, came out, and pretended to be an explorer. As I was exploring the market stain and the comforter, Ming asked me if I was going to call Vea mother from now on. <clears throat> Never, I said. Me neither, said Ming, not even if she locks me in the closet forever. That would never happen, I said. Why? Because if she ever hurt you, I would cast an evil spell on her that would turn her blind and deaf, and then she could never find you. <laughs> not only did Ming refuse to call Vea mother, she quit talking altogether. Not completely, but she hardly ever speaks to Vea at all anymore. She talks to me, though, sometimes too much. Mostly, she asks questions. One time last summer, she practically grilled me about Amelia, which is one of my least favorite things to talk about. It was hot that day, and we had to wear long sleeves because we were picking figs. If you don't wear long sleeves when you pick figs, your arms get itchy. Why did Amelia go in the river if she didn't know how to swim, asked Ming. She was only one year old when Amelia died. She was little. She didn't know any better, I said. I felt something turn in my belly. It's that feeling you get when you think of something terrible at an unexpected moment. I had only been thinking of figs, not my dead sister. But when Ming said her name, something turned. I was seven when Amelia drowned, but I remember like it was yesterday. I wish I could forget. I wish I was like Ming, too young to remember what it was like to have another sister. But then I wouldn't be able to remember my mother either, and no wish is worth that. Why wasn't Mama watching her closely, asked Ming. I thought real moms always watch closely. I tied my hair into a knot and pressed my lips together tight. Let's talk about something else, I said. I reached for a branch and held it down so she could pick the fruit. Let's play I Spy. Ming picked a fig and brought it to Mr. Elephant's stitched mouth. Mr. Elephant is her favorite stuffed animal. My father gave him to her right before we left the Philippines. Even though his name is Mr. Elephant, he's actually a purple giraffe. <laughs> she eyed the tree trunk and said, I spy something brown. Ming would make a terrible spy. <laughs> when I didn't guess right away, she looked up at me. Do you know what it is? Yes, it's the biggest broomstick ever made. Big enough for five witches. Ming looked around for the broomstick then said, no, it's the tree trunk. <laughs> I gave the tree a pat. This? Well, this is what I was talking about in the first place. All the witches have to do is come down, pull it out of the ground, and take off. They'll probably be here any minute. <laughs> Ming sighed and rolled her eyes as if I was the most immature playmate she'd ever had. Then she took a big breath of air and hurled Mr. Elephant's fig as far as she could. It landed just a few feet away. Did Mama have any sisters, she asked. The back of my neck dripped with sweat. She used to tell me she had a sister named Javelin, I said flatly. Suddenly I didn't feel like picking figs anymore. She called her Auntie Jove. Ming's eyes lit up like coins. Really? I hadn't thought of Auntie Jove in a while. Her name felt familiar, but strange, all at the same time. Once I started talking about her, I couldn't stop. I told Ming all about Auntie Jove's adventures and I, how I thought we would live with her after our mother died, but instead our father married Vea and brought us to Giverny. The fig tree didn't offer much shade, but the more I talked and watched Ming's eyes light up, the less I noticed the heat. When I finished, Ming was quiet for a moment. Then she kissed Mr. Elephant's head. Too bad you don't have any sisters, Mr. Elephant, she said. Mr. Elephant doesn't need sisters, I said. He has you. I grabbed one of the branches and shook. Everyone needs sisters, she said, as the figs fell at her feet. Mm -hmm. Thank you.